So what's next? As a former high school teacher and administrator, you have continued your interest in the work of teachers and the reform of schools. You have written six books and numerous articles, chapters, and editorials on the experiences of new teachers, working conditions, collective bargaining in the schools, the use of incentive pay plans for teachers, and leadership of superintendents. These were reviewed here. So what is next for you? Well, I'm not sure. Um, we are still working on finishing up um, a current study, some papers that come out of that, some articles, and I have to decide whether where that will go, whether we'll do a mm -hmm. book on that. Um, I, I tend to not plan ahead in a big way. Um, even when we started the project on the next generation of teachers, which has lots and lots of research in it that doctoral students have done and that we've done together, we had no idea where we were going. Um, I think that uh, one thing I, I want to do next year, I'm, I'll be on leave next year, and one thing I want to do is do more synthesis of what's known about these issues. There's been a great deal of research since 2000 about sure. teacher quality. I mean, it, sure. the idea of teacher quality was just you know, seldom mentioned before that in a in research um, circles. So um, I, I have been talking to a few people about thinking about how we might pull together what what do we know, what sure. do we not know, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of um, younger faculty members and doctoral students who want to you know contribute to this field. But sometimes they choose a random topic that's not really connected or about which there's not much, um, I don't know, it's not, con it, it's not something that seems even feasible. And I think we can generate some promising lines of research for people. In our project we did this so oh, probably five or six years ago, we did a, a literature review that it really just said these are all the topics and this is what we know um, and that has been and and here are some questions that are worth pursuing and I've had it's been on our website and so uh, a lot of doctoral students from around the country have looked at it and subsequently told me I I took that question and I'm sure. studying that oh, sure. so um, some kind of synthesis to so that people don't redo work that is not worth redoing, um, where time could be better spent really trying to figure out what's the next important question here. So something that way, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. Okay. What impact has your research had of which you are most proud? Um, I think that it, it's hard to nail down direct effects. I mean, I can, mm -hmm. I know schools that have adopted programs that I've highlighted and, you know, I, I think that probably the biggest impact has been um, the attention to teachers and the context of their work broadly. Um, working conditions for, for many years, was, that was just seen as m what might be bargained, but um, not in the way of thinking about the context in which people work and how that can make for happier people, better work, um, better student learning. And I think just broadly, I have been able to, to highlight that. Um, and it's, you know, it's always hard to say what, you know, unless you, sure. unless you have a great scientific discovery <laughs> and can really yeah. trace it, it's very hard, hard to see that. Um, I think I've probably contributed to a um, more open-minded view of unions among um, okay. people who are ready to be open-minded about that. Sure. Um, and I have identified some programs like this peer assistance and review program that I mentioned sure. before that I know work well and can be implemented successfully and I've really concentrate on getting information in a way to people so that they could use it. Okay. What impact, impact would you like your research still to have? Um, <clears throat> I think, and I don't think my research alone can have mm -hmm. such an impact, but I hope it will contribute, uh, contribute to 
um, creating more differentiated career path for teachers um, where people, you know, I, I think it's unrealistic to expect teachers to remain in the classroom for 30 years. It's We live in a different world. Sure. Uh, schools have to respond to that by having some people who become really the expert long-term teachers in a school who have responsibility um, for curriculum and instruction uh, in addition to a principal, but that there's more academic leadership in the okay. school. And um, and I, th I think that that has to happen um, both school by school, by individuals doing it, but also through policy, through creating um, real job descriptions and, and requirements and assessments that give it credibility and give it some permanence. Um, and that, uh, I don't think we're ever going to revert in public schools to the old kind of one teacher for as many years as you stay. I think, I think we can't do it. Either the, the schools will just continue to, That's old to school. fail. Yeah. Old school, for yeah. lack of a better term. Yeah, definitely old school. Okay, here's a set of introspective questions that we have. Okay. First one, who do you believe has had the greatest <clears throat> impact on you and the person and scholar you have become today? Wow. That's, a, that's really hard because there are it can be multiple a people. number of people. <laughs> you know, I think as far as the research that I do, Dan Lordy's work definitely did. And I never studied with him. I mean, I just, uh, I just revered what he did. I read School Teacher and I thought, this is so amazing that someone understands what happens with teachers. Um, and um, I continue, I have, um, I probably have four or five copies of the book, and um, when he retired, there was a, a celebration at AERA, and I was one of the people who spoke. And then he sent us these mint editions of School Teacher, uh. um, which, you know, so <laughs> I really find in that book, any idea I think I've had for the first time, I'll find it somewhere in the book. Oh, sure. and it'll be in one paragraph what I think is going to be, you know, big. So certainly in in that way he did. Jerry Murphy, who was my advisor and then was the dean when I was academic dean, and I have his name chair actually, um, taught me to do qualitative research. He was a political scientist, uh, and uh, I would. I, it would have taken me a long time to understand what that was about and why. Um, why it was for me, um, and and so that that was really uh, important. I mean, there were. <clears throat> it's it's very hard. There are a lot of people I have worked with, um, students of mine, sure. um, colleagues. Um, Pat Graham, who was my dean sure. when I was first hired, I um, she was a remarkable inspiration, and uh, she was subsequently at the Spencer Foundation. Uh, and was a great supporter there. Um, so there are many, there are many. Okay. What inspires you? Um, working with other people, kind of the energy of that and, and feeling like I can still participate in learning things that matter to people. You know, schools, I still am thrilled by being in schools. Sure. I love them. And when they're terrible, I tear up, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> um, I, you know, so I, that, that is very powerful. And you're inspired to make change and oh, help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you find uninspiring? Um, Simple-minded answers um, and, and kind of bureaucratic rules that I don't think will go anywhere. Well, those are a few. Fair enough. <laughs> There's a lot on that side of the ledger, but... What is your favorite word? Oh, my. I'm not sure I have one. I mean, there are words that entertain me, but I don't know whether I have a... I can't think of one. Okay. What's your favorite curse word? I couldn't say. Okay. 
<laughs> what profession other than your own would you have liked to attempt? You know, I, um, I thought at some point after I was in teaching that I should have gone to law school. Um, and that was when I saw that women were being recruited to law schools and that it really was an option. And there is a kind of, I, I like logic. I, I like oral argument kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I like the side of collective bargaining that has to do with arbitration and you know the, the statutes that control it. But I actually think I wouldn't have enjoyed it. Um, I, the, I, I would have enjoyed studying it. But maybe, you know, public interest law in some way would have interested me. My brother was a, an educator uh, and he was an advocate. Um, and he was a very intense, confrontational, um, challenging person. And he accomplished a whole lot doing it. Mm. Um, but it became clear to me that that my best mode of operating is not that. Um, it actually is about engaging people in kind of the most promising things that are possible. I think I do better at that. What other occupation other than your own would you have not liked to attempt? Mm, anything where I was very isolated and probably something that was very technical in the sense of... of uh, <laughs> I don't want to say anything that really would offend someone <laughs> who has, you know, but anything that's very repetitive. I get bored very easily. And that's been the wonderful thing about, about my, the opportunities I've had. I've kind of always been doing more than one thing. Uh, and as a faculty member, you know, I get to teach and I get to do research. I was able to be in administration for a while. Um, I get to consult, um, I, and that has traveling involved sure. with it. And I, I find that very exciting. I love that. So, um, you know, sitting, doing something routine, probably be fine. Right, what <laughs> What's your favorite book? Mm. Oh man, this, this is what happens when you're in the Miss America pageant <laughs> or you're running for president. But um, let me think. It's not about world peace. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's probably not about education um, in that that always feels, sure. you know, a bit like work. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I've read a lot of fiction and I enjoy it immensely. Um, and I like poetry. Sure. Um, I don't. I, I don't. I don't want to give you one title because then I'll think that's, that's fine. not the right one. If you could tell President Obama one thing, what would it be? Hmm. Well, in education, I think it would be don't put too much stock in value add mm. and this idea of finding the perfect teacher and relying really more on these um, these sort of the ideal teacher kind of piece as opposed to building a school um, and, and I think you know I think that we are getting a lot of that right now uh, and the Department of Education is promoting it and mm -hmm. and that has to be with President Obama's support mm -hmm. I mean in general I've you know an ardent supporter of President Obama, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think the problems with schooling are, are really complex and that when we look for a simple solution that can be applied everywhere, it's probably, you know, probably not right. I was very happy to hear him um, speak out about gun violence and about um, preschool education sure. mm -hmm. um, and so I totally support those those kinds of initiatives um, but I but I do think we ought to not imagine that uh, we can find a simple technical solution to what are essentially big social problems in our country which contradicts everything that you've done in your research yeah. is what how educational federal educational policy 
Yeah. And then the state policies trinkling down from yeah. there. Yeah. Contradictory. I mean, one of the nice things about Massachusetts is that we've had some very enlightened leadership on education. Mm -hmm. And um, although we have had a, a state test um, that is a challenging one, the mm -hmm. MCAS, um, it has been used very thoughtfully. And I think most teachers in the state would say, it's a pretty good exam. Mm. Um, so I, I think, you know, I, I'm, we have kind of pushed back on uh, our new teacher evaluation law, which, um, you know, is a year and a half old now, uh, does not include using student achievement as a particular percentage of a teacher's evaluation. And I, you know, I was involved in that process and know what thought went into that. And other legislatures have really been um, convinced somehow that you can use those data to, um, you know, to decide 50%, 40% of a teacher's evaluations. That's crazy. Yeah. So, and in some um, cases, trump the other measures. Yeah. So it's 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially if the other measures are, are you know, haphazardly done, which yeah. they often are. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So. If you could have dinner with anybody, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Oh, probably my mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get me started. Yeah. On that. Okay. I have a lot of questions for her. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Finally, what advice might you offer to graduate students and beginning researchers who hope to make a contribution like you to education, educational mm -hmm. research? Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was very lucky because I could pretty much decide what I wanted to work on. And, um, you know, it, there wasn't, I had to publish, but there weren't these kind of, um, you know, very rigid expectations about what journals and what kind of article and what kind of methods and, um, and, I have really been able to do the work that I wanted to do. And I think um, my daughter's graduating, yeah. <laughs> you know, in a couple years. And um, she would like to be an academic. And I, I do look at the way the job is organized now, the pressure, the number of people who actually become adjunct faculty members because they love it, but they have no time to do research. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I actually talk with students a lot about this who are trying to figure out what they want to do and, and tell them to think very carefully about what makes them happy day to day. Because sometimes it's people who suffered writing their dissertations. You know, really, they found it interesting, but they were miserable during right. the time. Well, that's at least a third of your work is about that kind of work. So mm -hmm. you want you want to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, you know, if you can't, if you can't follow the questions that interest you with the approaches that you believe you have the most to contribute on, um, I don't think it's worth doing. I would rather be, you know, continuing to teach kids sure. than doing that. Sure. Um, so I, I think, um, I think it's a hard time to be starting out. On the other hand, it, just as we've had this massive turnover in the teaching force with, uh, you know, my generation retiring, that's happening now at, at higher education. So we also sure. have had this kind of bimodal distribution of, of faculty members, and many of us, um, you know, are in the pre-retirement or semi-retirement mode. Um, <clears throat> so there are a lot of opportunities coming up, and sure. I know we have hired just some tremendous um, junior faculty members who, um, you know, I'm sure have great careers ahead of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, it's, it's not a period of no jobs, um, and right. it was for a while. Right. Um, and so there are a lot of opportunities, but I, I, I do think that, you know, everything is becoming, in, in public school and higher education, uh, being reduced to a lot of counting, um, uh, to, to looking at how many articles, in sure. what journals, what kind of ranking do those journals have, uh, how many hits does something get. And I, and I think that if, you, if you're living with that and that's, you know, it's not where you want to be, it could be very hard. Anxiety provoking. Yeah. 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 
Finally, when asked to capture the essence and nature of Susan Moore Johnson, Pat Graham, your friend, colleague, and again, the former dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, wrote that you are a supremely integrated individual with remarkable accomplishments in several domains. You exemplify at very high levels what we wish to achieve with our students, wit and character. You are, of course, an accomplished scholar, but while you take your scholarship seriously, you wear it lightly, just as you do the extraordinary mentoring of your students. The principles you hold dear of integrity, concern of others, and commitment to improvement of society suffice your work. Your friend and colleague, Alan Grossman, writes that you are serious about your work, totally reliable in delivering what you commit to doing. You are deeply caring for your peers and students, and firm in your beliefs, but flexible enough to change after consideration of alternative ideas and approaches. You work hard and will not accept anything less than excellence. Your friend and former student, Will Marinell, describes you as having a terrific sense of humor. You are quick to laugh, and you have a sharp wit, natural comedic timing, and you can both <laughs> give and take a joke well. He also describes you as a master of your trade teaching. Fundamentally, it comes back to that. Edward Liu echoes that sentiment, describing you as brilliant, wise, amazingly generous, loyal to those who, whom you have helped along the way, as well as able to engender intense loyalty among those you have mentored. Your friend and colleague, Monica Higgins, also highlights the personal and professional impact that you have had on colleagues and students alike, noting that some of your students affectionately call you Smojo. Did you know that? Oh, of course. <laughs> they, they, they think that I've never heard it before, or that when they talk about me as SMJ, that's another one. Um, I, I, yes, I use it myself. <laughs> she says we never say that to her face, but <laughs> she adds that Smojo is more than just a simple nickname. It embodies your presence at Harvard, demanding and respected, yet nurturing and joyful. This rare combination of characteristics naturally leads to quite the following among students. This is the common theme that you have these, the student following that are very loyal to you given everything that you've done to, to impact their lives. Your friend and former doctoral student Morgan Donaldson explains that in your teaching, research, writing, and mentoring, you commit yourself fully to the task. She adds that when she thinks of you, the end of E.B. White's Charlotte's Web comes to mind. She was in a class by herself it is not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. You are indeed a class by yourself. Your friend and colleague, Susan Cardos, describes two other, albeit conflicting, images of you. The first is Susan the Giant, whose professional accomplishments are intellect and intellect are gigantic, adding that your abilities to build relationships, to, de to design processes and build communities, and to set goals and achieve them are immense. The other image is of Susan, the fairy princess, <laughs> who is graceful yet powerful. You're wise and magical. Your spirit is luminescent. You're, she's also pretty sure that you can fly. <laughs> On to your family. Your daughter, Erica, notes, along with Susan Cardos, that in high school, your debating coach called you a tiger. That nickname is still apt. You are tireless and fearless in working towards your goals. You believe in excellence, but you also believe in doing good in the world and treating others well. You're quite a special kind of tiger. And your son, Krister, writes that he is not sure if your most significant accomplishments lies with one single act or event, but he describes it you, as, you as a wonderful and devoted mother and now grandmother, noting that you and his father have been married for over 45 years, and that alone is your most significant accomplishment. <laughs> Not to mention your commitments as a runner. He notes that five to six days a week for over 25 years before anyone in the house had ever woken up, you were out running. You have always had tireless energy in your personal and professional life. Well, there's no doubt, <laughs> again in the words of your son, Kirster, to many people in the world, you are an esteemed academic, a tenured Harvard professor, and an author. The fact that you have so, much, so many fans and admirers in both your professional and personal life is your greatest compliment. Krister adds that he doesn't know how you did it, but you never compromised on either your family or your profession. 
on behalf of all of us, educators, scholars, future educationists, educational researchers, and the like, we'd like to thank, thank you, Dr. Susan Moore Johnson, for everything you do and mostly for being you, working on all of our behalves. Thank, thank you, you Audrey. <laughs> it's been a pleasure interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> that's all, folks. <laughs>